Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat. I'm talking today with Cameron. Hello. Hi, I'm uh, Cameron Vetter. Um, I'm an MVP for artificial intelligence and I've gotten it for three years now. Excellent. And, and where are you and what do you do? Who do you work for? Or what do you do? Yeah, so I'm out of the Milwaukee area in Wisconsin and uh, I work for the Octavian Technology Group where I'm the principal architect there and uh, my focus areas are um, machine learning and artificial intelligence really focused on applied AI versus the theoretical stuff. So how do we actually use AI within your business and apply that to your products is kind of the big focus there. And then I do a lot of work also with Azure and cloud architecture and helping people um, either figure out how to move their footprint into the cloud or help them figure out how to um, maybe make better use of the cloud or design applications targeting the cloud. But those are the big focuses of our uh, consulting company. Well, you know, so I mean, a great point is because AI as a category is pretty broad, covers a number of different areas. I'm always interested, like how it's actually being used. Cause even like Microsoft, they made some announcements of, of about a bunch of AI around IOT, for example, the mm -hmm. internet of things for those that don't know, uh, but where they, they actually showed like a, a manufacturing scenario uh, of, you know, uh, of field personnel being able to utilize the technology to, you know, automate a lot of their work and identify problem areas around equipment. I mean, those were seeing those real world examples of it always makes it so much more, well, real around it. So yes. what is so when you talk about AI and talk about you know applied AI, what does that actually mean? Well, it, it really depends on the, the customer and the vertical that they're in, but uh, the, the places that we, we do a lot of work um, are a little bit on the line of business side. So taking a look at some of the internal workflows at, at companies and even some of the workflows that are behind the scenes on products. And we'll take a look at those workflows and kind of look for easy areas where a machine could do as well or better with uh, with machine learning and help apply that to the business. You know, a big focus of what we do is taking a look at, you know, it, if, if you've got these 10 different opportunities where we could apply machine learning into your business, let's figure out which ones are going to bring the most value or be the easiest ones to implement or a little bit of both and figure out how to bring those to your business. So, so that's kind of one of the big areas is looking at kind of the back end, the workflows and some of that stuff. So uh, an example, I have one customer where we, we take a look at, they get a particular type of email and they get thousands of them a week. And uh, we do some analysis on those emails and use uh, various uh, natural language processing to, to figure out some key information. And we were able to auto filter out about 60% of that email. And even the ones that we don't filter out, we are able to figure out key information about it so that there's kind of a scorecard that comes along with the email when a human gets it. So that even for those, the, the person's able to actually work much more quickly. So that, that's kind of some of the, the less exciting machine learning that we do, but the stuff that really adds a ton of value for companies. And I feel like that's a big uh, area that uh, a lot of people don't talk that much about, but really is where uh, some of the big value is. Um, the other thing that we do is a little bit more on the fun side, which is doing stuff that's product facing. Um, so something that the customer will actually interact with mm -hmm. and will directly impact. Um, a, a good example of that um, is we, we did some stuff with pose recognition using the Azure Connect cameras. And what we were doing is helping, um, you know, imagine that you have a gym class and you have some students doing, say, a standing long jump. That's a, that's a classic example that the Azure Connect team was using for a while. Well, being able to um, do some evaluation on what happened during that jump, or that jump and, um, you know, how were the, the leg movements? How was the explosiveness on the jump? How, what was the actual distance and you know, applying that to various other events 
Yeah. Um, that, that was an example of something we did and it, it was kind of fun and exciting. And then we, we threw some 3D renders on top of that to show what was happening with the skeletal structure as they were mm -hmm. doing, uh, doing these things. But yeah, that, that's more of the, the fun customer but, facing. Really I, I can think stuff. of a practical application of that having been injured and gone through a couple of years, um, two different injuries of physical therapy. And where they're doing the, you know, they're watching my run, my walk, my gait, mm -hmm. and they look at the movement and, and the other injury was to my shoulder. So it's great to have leg injuries followed almost immediately upon healing uh -huh. by the, by the, uh, the shoulder injury. But um, it, it, so much of it was, you know, that, that expert, that physical therapist watching those movements right. and testing those things to be able to capture that. And then with office visits, capturing that and doing a comparison of data uh, over time, I mean, it's something that yeah. is difficult to do manually. It, it is. And uh, I actually have a friend who's also an MVP that uh, is doing something very much in that space. Um, and yeah, the, the, they're kind of taking advantage of it to bring most of the expertise of that physician or that trained person bring that to you via AI and maybe do, again, it's it's never about totally replacing people, at least that's our experience. It's more about augmenting their abilities or maybe kind of getting a big chunk of the work done automatically and then sending the hard cases to the human expert. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of the approach that they're taking with the, the product that he's working on. And yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty neat stuff. And there's a lot of very practical and useful information. I know we, we, we've talked there another company that uh, runs soccer leagues and they were looking at various products in that space using kind of mixed reality to understand uh, mixed reality and machine learning to understand um, you know, how the kids were doing when they were doing various soccer drills mm -hmm. so that they could advise. And, you know, it's not just about advising to, it's being able to compare progress and see how, how did things change in six months? Mm -hmm. um, are, are we seeing the progress we should? And that kind of gives some metrics for the coaches as well. Are we, are we leading to a place where we have all that kind of tracking so you can actually for athletes is a great example, but to see if they're even their patterns are it's on decline or post injury, how they're improving. Right. I mean, that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I'd imagine they'll be coming soon. I'm not familiar with a product that does exactly that, but there is a lot of products in the athletic space, especially at the professional level. So I'm sure if, if that's not, it doesn't exist, it will soon. And then and we're just one step, one step more where we have the microchip embedded and then we um, just there get zapped go. and neutralized if we become uh, you know less efficient to society. <laughs> I've heard the conspiracy theory. I, I tell you, I, I'm actually doing a, a series of talks right now that uh, are talking about uh, doing evil with AI. And kind of kind of dive in into all of that um, and putting it, ideas a, in people's a, heads. That's great. That's great. <laughs> yep. I have instructions somewhere, right? Yeah, that's right. But no, taking a look at because there's there's a lot of opportunities and ethics is really important in my space right now and figuring out what ethics should look like. And, yeah. you know, we're, we're struggling with um, going too far and being gatekeepers and kind of holding back technology yeah. versus uh, just leaving it wide open and letting people just go go nuts and letting the criminals do what they want and figuring out where the, where the happy medium is somewhere in between there well I, mean, yeah, I, I think there, we've got a ways to go there yeah no i agree I, I was gonna make the joke that it's like you know i don't think there was yet an ai chapter the anarchist cookbook but yeah i mean look there's bad people are going to do bad things if you don't have an understanding of what's possible then you can't protect against those things that's why security companies will often hire hackers so mm -hmm. that you can go and build build a better better protection around what you know what you do so um you have to Absolutely. exploit things to find the weaknesses to you know so and yeah. that that is the real point of the talks that i've been giving lately is just to kind of make people aware of the stuff that's out there and what's yeah. going on and you know in certain spaces there, there's so much publicity right now like what's yeah. going on with stable diffusion and the ability to to generate images based off text like everybody's heard about that and everybody's playing with that 
but I, I don't think people fully understand the criminal implications yeah. and the fraud implications. And so helping, helping people kind of see what the steps are and how easy it is uh, helps people understand, you know, maybe not to fall for that stuff. Yeah. We've got some, as a society, I feel like we have some really tough times ahead in the next five years because what's really expensive to do right now to, to make that video that just nails it and fakes a person is probably something that anybody's going to be able to do uh, with no skill at all within a year or so. Pretty quick. Yeah. 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 That's why I, you know, I've I talked with a couple of people that's I, I, I've been getting the, like the Facebook ads and Twitter ads I've been seeing in my profile for like the AI generated content, like don't need worry about blogging and let AI go and do that. And I've talked mm -hmm. to some people who are in that space and who have actually played with it. And they're like, you know, if you're obviously if you write something that's technical, that is to a, like I'm in the you know, collaboration stack. So SharePoint and teams and that kind of stuff to go yeah. and write a, to, to have AI generate something like it's more difficult to do where it's technical, it's where it's specific, but to do just kind of broader marketing related um, things it's easier to go and build around that but it's going to become increasingly uh, you know, easy think of like feeding in and automating anything it, it, it ai only needs like you know five to ten samples of of like an article of that writing style to be able to start to mimic your writing style even less at this point actually yeah. if you give me one i can give you a pretty good emulation of your style at this point and uh you know how much I, do you I pay for that service for, to to do that writing yeah. for me <laughs> uh, it's virtually free um yeah. i actually use i do it all the time personally so yeah. um you know one one of my least favorite consulting activities is writing sows yeah um uh lately every sow i've written has been co-written by an uh ml model uh, so i let it do the initial writing just yeah. kind of tell it what points I want to be in there. And then I just do a little bit of editing and I'm good to go. And it's, yeah. it's cut my time down significantly. Well, you know, I was just thinking of, uh, uh, you know, one Microsoft syntax. We talk, I don't know if you're playing with that any, you know, but that kind of specifically just jumps right into that, that area. I just think of my mother-in-law who is retired now, but was a paralegal for years and then did nothing but, um, put together uh, and write grants for a company that she worked mm -hmm. for for years and was doing that while living abroad. And so much of that is like, you don't need to write the majority of it now. It's just templated, right. scripted, and and the, you know, the AI does the lion's share of the work. But, yep. And uh, I don't think a lot of people are making full use of that yet, but I'm starting to see services pop up. Uh, and frankly, I feel like a lot of the services that are popping up are kind of gouging people on costs and are super expensive, but that'll probably normalize. Speaking um, of Microsoft syntax, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's, that's a, a big part of what that is. If you're in a, I mean, you think of it, if you're in an industry where you have kind of structured collaboration, you know, a lot of contracts, uh, you know, scope of work, you know, like documentation things, standardize reporting uh, around that, you can automate so much of that uh, for the creation of, of new yes. documents, new deliverables. Um, so you can really train those things to, to go and build that and get really smart around you know, uh, uh, of how those are, are created. It, anyway, it's it's an right. interesting space that there's a lot going on. It, it is. And we're talking to numerous clients about starting to, as that being part of the stuff now that you can automate in your workflow because a lot of that cookie cutter text that you write for various reasons in your line of business, right? Just tell it the style you want, tell it the little details that you want to be in there and let, let the ML write it. And I mean, we're to a point where, if it's specific enough, you probably can just about trust it to be right and not even check it. Yeah. What it's writing in certain areas, uh, which is fantastic. And I'm really the, eager to see. I was going to say, and, and with the language, with the, with the transcription or the translation services too, that's improving greatly. So it's not just write yes. it, but then write it. Here's the languages I need that. Yes. No. And that, that's fantastic. And I love, 
um, that, that that's kind of opening up a whole lot of uh, communication collaboration that wasn't there, kind of getting into that Star Trek communicator uh, level of capabilities. I, I think we're going to see a lot of that stuff in the next year. Uh, a lot of people walking around with little apps that are doing that sort of thing. But yeah. what's really compelling to me is seeing what uh, seeing what some of these large language models can do. Because it used to be that you could sort of get a decent translation. And now it's like, no, you can get a translation that's better than what somebody that has years of a foreign language experience would be able yeah. to do. And you can get that out of today's models. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm really eager to see what comes out. There, there's a couple of really big language models expected to come out in 2023. And I think they're going to be as earth shattering as what we saw in the last year or two. So I think we're going to have a big leap forward next year. Well, I, I'm excited to see that because that, I actually had, uh, had an experience. So right before the pandemic was on a flight, was sitting in Seattle and had two women who were tourists over from China. And now I had to have the Wi-Fi working to be able to use it. But using the translator was sitting there mm -hmm. with the two of them and had a conversation. I would just speak into it. It would then output the speaker. And I think that was like the I, I don't think it was the Microsoft. I think it was the Google translator. But anyway, to be able to do that sure. right on my phone and then they would recite it. And I hit record and do in choppy English. But we were able to go back and right. forth and have a conversation was just incredible. So that's where I do want it in a little Star Trek button. I just want to go. To yes. It, you know, and. And honestly, I think we're, we're only a couple of years from being able to make really good models that are small enough to actually have, at least in your phone. Because <clears throat> think of how much better that would have been without having to have the internet connection and have the time delay that you probably were watching, right? Yeah. As it was taking a couple seconds. Imagine if that was instantaneous, like, yeah. you know. That would be and, fantastic. And, right. And then if it could be compact enough that I could, you know, download something and have it embedded within my phone, maybe by language right. or something, you know, versus have it to have to um, get out to the internet, have that, you know, connectivity to be able to do it. Hey, hey Cameron, I know that I usually start out at the, towards the beginning of it. We jump right in the conversation, which is, is fine. But I always like to ask, like, what was your path to becoming an MVP? So what were you doing oh, before sure. and, and kind of how did you get into the program? So, um, well, I've been in the Microsoft stack for about almost 25 years at this point, starting back in, I think it was Visual Studio 5, I think was about where I got started in the Microsoft stack. And I was doing software before them, but not in the Microsoft stack. And uh, But anyway, so I've been in there for years and years and years and always going to conferences and always enjoying what the MVPs were bringing to the table at conferences and what they were participating in. But I was really more in industry in various roles. I wasn't doing a lot of consulting. So I, I never really pushed that hard on it. But once I, I got focused on consulting, maybe seven or eight years ago, I realized that, well, now's my chance. I could actually become an MVP. MVP. So anyway, how I got nominated is I got nominated actually in mixed reality. I was um, in the early HoloLens one. So I was mm -hmm. one of the early people to get that device. And I wrote uh, this massive series of blog posts um, that were kind of digging into some of the real deep uh, technical um, kind of spatial uh, uh, processing stuff that was going on with the HoloLens. And it was basically covering a lot of undocumented stuff and how to do it. And uh, so that got a lot of attention from various folks. But um, based on that, somebody nominated me. And uh, he's actually now the PM of that team, the person that nominated me. And uh, but yeah, I wasn't getting anywhere in that space. So I, I ended up uh, taking the advice of uh, one of my friends that's an MVP and switching kind of directions to where I was actually working, which was in the machine learning space. I transitioned mm -hmm. over to there already. Um, and as it happened, there were hardly any, it was a new MVP. So I was the sixth person in the United States to get an AI MVP. Mm -hmm. So one of the very early ones. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I'm, most of my, my efforts were around speaking and doing workshops and teaching and contributing at user groups, both as hosting and um, running them. But I, I was doing various things here and there. 
um, also with contributing to open source projects as well, mm -hmm. but uh, kind of all of those things. And to be honest, I didn't really change a lot of what I was doing. I just started uh, maybe tracking it and aiming it more, yep. but I was still doing very much the same stuff. So, I mean, if anyone's listening to this and wants some advice about being an MVP, if you're looking at what you have to do and saying, oh, now I have to do all this extra stuff, you probably don't want to be an MVP. You, you only want to be an MVP. Well, in my opinion, you, it's really only worth pursuing if you already have a passion for being involved in the community. Mm -hmm. If that's something you're already doing, um, it's a pretty short putt to get to be an MVP. But if you force it, it's actually a lot of work. If yeah. you're, um, yeah. I've talked to numerous people that have pursued it that way. And it, it becomes a lot of work, but anyway. So that's that's yeah. how I became MVP, and um, you know, I'm still uh, uh, the, on occasion I've been referred to as an honorary uh, member of the mixed reality space. I still pay a lot of attention to that, and and go to most of uh, most of the mixed reality mm -hmm. stuff as well. And uh, but uh, by and large, I'm I'm very I'm doing a lot of stuff in the AI space just because that's where my consulting yeah. is as well. Well, you know, it, it used to be that like I started as a SharePoint MVP and it was one of the first that moved over to the Office 365. And so now it's the, all in the same bucket. They kind of, you know, they change the buckets around occasionally. Right. But one of the benefits of, you know, like we were talking before we started recording about you know, that one of the greatest, one of the best benefits of being an MVP is actually the annual MVP summit where we used to pre-pandemic get together and you know, and network and, and so, but it used to be very closed off. Like all the SharePoint MVPs were all together for that entire week out of that event. Mm -hmm. And in the years, uh, a couple of years before uh, pandemic, they made it so that you're an MVP, you're a Microsoft MVP. So even though you're mm -hmm. an AI MVP, if, if you want to go spend that entire week and your focus, you want to participate in all of the, you know, uh, uh, the Azure events or, you know, specifically over in your know, Microsoft teams or, IOT or whatever that area is, you can go in and do that. It's, it's like uh, being in college and taking elective courses. And, you know, right. and so it, it, they've really opened that up. Um, the downside to all of that, going back to your point of, uh, of, you know, the additional work, like I'm passionate about it, learning about all the tech, different technologies mm -hmm. and different areas. It can be overwhelming that there is a lot that's out there and you, you don't have to try and do it all. Um, but, uh, you know, like the, there's a certain volume of activities of things that I do in the community. You have to find that right rhythm, that pattern for those things yes. and, uh, still investigate new things and, yeah, uh, find, find what works for you. And like you said, what, what aligns with what you do in your day job, as well as what yep. your passions are, uh, for the after hours. Yeah, and I think that's a key element. And, you know, finding the rhythm, I found it to be really tricky, actually, to figure out the pandemic rhythm. Yeah. Um, because what I was doing just naturally before no longer works because almost all of it was in person. Yeah. And as we were talking about beforehand, I've been super excited to get back in person. Um, just being out there, talking to people, meeting new people. And that's, that's the fun stuff, at least for me it is. Yeah, no, completely agree. Uh, looking forward to get back out there. Glad to see things starting to open up again. And, and at the same time, just uh, trying to make sure that I, uh, you know, as an empty nester, I don't have kids to worry about. And you know, my wife is, is uh, you know, works full and, and is also finishing her degree. And so it's kind of me and the dog and it's easy to uh, get carried away and do too much. You got to pace yourself as well. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's great advice. That is, I, I've caught myself going too fast at times and had to, had to pull back quite a bit as I realized that I was, you know, speaking 50 or 60 times a year. And that was like way, way too much. Yeah. But it's, it's easy because it, like I said, it's fun. Yeah. Uh, the fun to me, every speaking engagement, it's the people I meet. That's the fun part. And I've had people look uh, at me weird to say, well, what is, what's your hobby? I said, I blog. They're like, what? It's like, yeah, I, I right. really enjoy doing that. So, yeah, you know, yep. we're crazy. Right, crazy. exactly. <laughs> well, I, you know, what I enjoy about it is, you know, every per new person I meet, they end up teaching me something, right? Yeah. Everybody's got their different expertise. Everybody's got their different interests. So I, I you know, 
it's kind of a two-way street at least i hope so they yeah. they get to know me and learn something from me and i get to learn something from them yeah, and maybe make here. a new friend along the way one of my favorite things that's why i love amas i love panels the discussions that yes yeah you know, I, I like to uh uh you know crowdsource my my questions my issues yep for sure for well, Cameron, sure. really appreciate your time today. For folks that want to connect with you, reach out. What are the best ways to reach you through social? Um, LinkedIn is by far the best place to find me. Um, I'm Cameron Vetter on there. All one word is my LinkedIn. Um, and then I'm Posh Porcupine on Twitter. And I only use Twitter for business purposes, but I'm, I'm definitely out there on Twitter. And those are primarily the two social places that I'm at. Um, I also have a blog, which I just figured out was down right before this, but <laughs> it's www.cameronvetter.com. And my company's address is octaviantg.com. Excellent. And I'll have all the links, of course, out on the buckleplanet.com blog and out on YouTube as well, so that everybody can find Cameron's info. So, Cameron, really appreciate your time and hopefully. We'll see you this next spring, fingers crossed, at the next oh, MVP Summit. I sure hope so. I look forward to meeting you there. Ah!